If you gave an infinite number of futurists an infinite number of amount of time, would one of them eventually get something right? I wrote a book a few years ago about what I thought would happen over the next 50 years, and I was instantly called a futurist. And I'm now regularly called upon uh, to make predictions. But the history of future prediction isn't particularly good. I'll give you a couple of examples. In 1886, the engineer Carl Benz confidently predicted that the worldwide demand for automobiles would never surpass one million. Eight years later, in 1894, an article appeared in the Times newspaper in London suggesting that within 50 years, every single street in London would be buried under nine feet of horse manure. How did they get it wrong? Extremely simple. Both predictions were based on past experience. They extrapolated from current trends, and they used critically false assumptions. In the case of Carl Benz, who I suppose should have known better, he assumed that cars would always, required show, would always require a chauffeur, and that the supply of highly skilled chauffeurs would eventually dry up. In the case of the article in The Times, the mistake was to assume that the growth in horse transport would go alongside the growth in the population of London. And also, they critically failed to see the impact of the invention of the motor car by Mr. Benz. Now, on the other hand, um, the accuracy of some predictions can be actually quite good, um, especially if you give them enough time to come true. I mean, it seems that hindsight is almost a, a necessarily a complement to futurism. A few years ago, I was uh, wandering through the English countryside, and I came across a church selling old books, and I bought a couple of books. The first one is this one. It's called Originality by T. Sharper Nolson, and it was written um, in 1917, and it was about the future. Uh, here he is quoting somebody called Sir Aston Webb, who was talking about the London of 2014 from the perspective of the 20th of January 1914, obviously 1914 being quite an interesting year. He says, this is his prediction, there are two great railway stations, one for the north and one for the south. The great roads out of London are 120 feet wide with two divisions, one for slow moving traffic and the other for fast moving traffic and there'll be a huge belt of green fields surrounding London. I mean, that's, that's not bad. By the way, this actually book is 97 years old and smells rather good, and I'm just not sure you can do that with a Kindle. Now, the second one, that was a pound, by the way. This one was 50p. It's uh, Future Shock by Alvin Toffler from 1970, so it's 41 years old. And if you're not aware of this book, get hold of it. It's really quite interesting, um, but it's getting more interesting because the central idea of this book is that technological change is accelerating and it's making people really quite delirious and quite anxious. And I'll just read um, a passage out of this. And he's talking about organizations. And you've got to remember, this was written in 1970. The high rate of turnover is most dramatically symbolized by the rapid rise of what executives call project or task force management. Here, teams are assembled to solve specific short-term problems. Then, exactly like the mobile playgrounds, they are disassembled and their human components reassigned. Sometimes these teams are thrown together to serve only a few days. Sometimes they are intended to last a few years. But unlike the functional departments or divisions of a traditional bureaucratic organization, which are presumed to be permanent, the project or task force team is temporary by design. I mean, I don't think that's too bad. Now, admittedly, some of these things aren't, aren't specific predictions. I mean, the list of these goes on. I mean, you've got Peter Drucker talking about the need uh, of portfolio careers in the 1980s. You have Warren Bennis, who was talking about the need for really radical innovation in the 1960s. Uh, you go back even further, you've got H.G. Wells in his book, The Shape of Things to Come in 1933, talking about launching ballistic m missiles from submarines. You've got Arthur C. Clarke in 1945, for seeing a, a network of communication satellites orbiting the Earth. And who could forget James T. Kirk using what appears to be a Motorola Razor cell phone way before any such thing had actually been invented. 
Now, as I just said, these aren't specific predictions in a sense. Nobody's putting a date against anything necessarily. But this doesn't negate the fact that occasionally a few seers do actually get it right. And I think the, the future would actually be a really good subject for study if only a few of the sources were a bit more forthcoming. Now, if you're thinking about the future, I think a map's quite useful. Um, so this is a bit of a doodle that went a bit mad that I did last year. And it's, it's what I think is going to happen over the next 50 years on a piece of A3 paper. And the way this works, and I know you won't be able to read this, but I'll just explain it. The center is now, and we have a lot of hotspots or megatrends. So we have globalization smack in the middle with localism coming off it. We have urbanization. Uh, we have volatility, debt, anxiety, which is coming off the debt and a few other things. Uh, we have climate change. We have sustainability, the power shift eastwards, aging. This is all now. And then you have time zones. And the minute you go out of the current day, you obviously get into predictions. And the predictions get more playful and more provocative as you, as you move further out. I should also explain that the colored lines are different things. So finance, I think, is red. And you've got media, a different color, science and technology, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, some of the predictions that are in there. Um, we've got people renting dreams. We have got robot population surpassing the human population. We've got brain holidays, which I badly need. We've got convergen the convergence of healthcare and financial planning because we know what we're going to get ill from decades in advance. We've got face recognition doors. We've got augmented reality contact lenses. We've got online communities starting real communities and so on and so forth. Um, and I say that the one to just bear in mind is the anxiety which is coming off this general mess. I mean, this has got far too much information on. It's far too complex, but you could argue, well, that's just the future. Get used to it. But you've got to be careful. Be very, very careful. Um, trends like the ones in the middle can get you into an awful lot of trouble. In fact, I think they can probably get you into more trouble than the predictions around the edges, because there's a nasty habit of actually people believing this stuff, uh, which is, as I've said earlier on, is, is, a, is a little bit tricky. Um, trends really, I suppose, represent an unfolding of an event or events or, or dispositions. And they don't really tell us anything about the future at all. Um, they don't tell us about future direction. They don't tell us about the velocity of events and so on. They certainly don't usually uh, consider counter trends, anomalies, uh, weird and seemingly illogical combinations of events that actually clash. But I think there's actually a much bigger problem than this. And that problem is, is essentially that, in my view, there is no such thing as the future. I mean, if you accept that the future is, is uncertain or at least ambiguous, I would argue there must be many alternative futures. Um, you know, there's not one. There are lots of different possibilities. And I think that's quite a clever way of, of looking at the future. Now, the alternative is, is to make some logical um, forecasts. This is an oil supplies company in the early 1980s in the US who were trying to work out the demand for their products. So they were trying to work out how many active oil rigs there'd be. And they did a very logical high, low, medium forecast, which are the solid line, th these lines here. This is actually what happened. Whoops. How did that happen? Well, again, they misread a trend, a long-term trend. Is actually, it was actually a short-term trend. There was a very high oil price. There were very low interest uh, rates. And there was very high government support for drilling. And that essentially warped reality, if you a sense. I mean, they, they essentially made the same mistake as Carl Benz in the Times newspaper. They extrapolated from experience. Um, they also failed to remember, I think, a very important point, which is that whilst nearly all of our knowledge is about the past, virtually all of our most important decisions are actually about the future. So what can we do to address this sort of central problem of prediction? I mean, is there actually any point at all trying to predict the future? Is it a better idea to just sit back and let the future happen to you? probably be more relaxing. Um, letting the future happen to you is actually not a bad option. It, it can really, really work, but only if you are quite nimble. I think you have to have a very open mind, and you have to move, adapt very, very quickly. And then a sort of fast follower strategy can work very well. However, most organizations, in my experience, are neither nimble nor open. They're actually mentally closed. Uh, to the outside world, and they tend to be stuck with sort of systems and, and, and assets and attitudes that were created in the past. They are built around historical ideas, and they're constrained by legacy issues, and they're concerned primarily, particularly commercial organizations, with numbers that, that relate to the last 12 months, and they're worried about what's going to happen to those numbers over the next 12 weeks or the next 12 months. So they don't go out very, very far. A much better bet, in my, instance, in my experience, is a thing called scenario planning. Now, 
Scenario planning essentially has its origins in, in battle planning or in war gaming, particularly uh, a 6th century Indian game called Katarunga, meaning four divisions, and also a, a German war game that was invented in 1812 called Kriegspiel. Now, wargaming is still used by the military today, and it's also used by companies like Shell that are spending a lot of money in the future. And, and they, they develop sort of narrative scenarios to look at the potential impact of a number of variables on, on things like uh, long-term capital or expenditure and so on. Now, to illustrate how scenarios work, here's some uh, a set of scenarios I did a little while ago with a few friends. And we, well, you, first of all, you need a question about the future. You know, you can't just say, what do you want to know about the future? You, you've got to have something quite specific. And the way I like to explain this is, pretend that time travel really exists, and the inventor has just come back from the future to say hi. What do you want to ask? You can ask one question, what is it? And yes, you can ask, when will I die, or when will Germany win the World, World Cup again? But it should really relate more to sort of an institutional thing, something like that. The, the, the question here was around uh, consumer mindsets in uh, 20 years' time. And once you've got your question sorted, you then need to look at what consultants would call critical uncertainties, but I tend to call really important stuff we don't know the answer to. And we've got two here. One is pessimism versus optimism around the economy and particularly climate change. And the other is the level of uh, customer or consumer activism versus passivism. So down here, it's very, very passive. It's purely about me. I mean, it's, it's individualism. Up here, it's, it's much more about the group. It's much more collectivist. It's getting very, very involved. And if you impose one axis against the other, four future worlds pop out. In the middle, it's the same world, but they become more distinct and more extreme as you move out into the corners. And this is clearly a dotted line because they do bleed into each other. Now, over here, we have moreism, which, you know, it's, it's very optimistic and it's built around the individual. So it's all about growth, consumerism, shopping, very much focused on me, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, was very much where we were prior to about 2008. It's, it's global, it's free markets, it's deregulated, and so on and so forth. Over here we have personal fortress where people think it's the end of the world and there's nothing they can do about it. So the best bet is to just sort of run to the mountains with lots of canned food and ammunition. Um, up here it's actually quite pleasant. It's quite local and community driven, but down in the corners it gets quite nasty, gets quite xenophobic. And when we're looking to blame somebody, we don't like anyone that's not considered to be part of the group. So it's very protectionist, very isolationist. The good thing is it's quite self-reliant and community driven. Um, we were there for a little while when the recession hit and a few other things, but we kind of got bored with that. So we, we've come up to enoughism a bit now. And this is the sort of attitude that we've got enough and we've had enough. We've got to change how the model works, how the world works. It's not a sustainable model. So it's a world of sort of switching things off on living or getting used to living on less. It's very, very ethical. It's uh, lots of um, environmental policies, social policies, and so on. More of a sort of work-life balance. You'd measure happiness in this world and so on and so forth. And innovation is, is focused on an end goal and it's very sustainable. Over here, we have Smart Planet. We've talked a bit about Silicon Valley already. This is the, the, the personification of Silicon Valley. I mean, Smart Planet is an unshakable belief in science and technology. It will solve all of our problems. So this is the land of Google and Apple and so on and so forth. Very technologically driven. It'll get increasingly virtual, accelerated, digital, and so on and so forth. And the question, to some extent, is, you know, where are we and where are the big shifts occurring and so on and so forth. Now. This is all sort of very well, but there's, there's still a bit of a problem with this. Um, and the problem really is that, yes, you can track emergent scenarios. You can have contingency plans for all four, or for another four, but you can't really have four strategies. So really, at the end of the day, I think you actually have to commit to where it is you actually want to go to. And, and therein lies a bit of a problem. Our leaders are supposed to have a clear vision of the future. They are supposed to understand what will happen if we take a certain path. But in my experience, most leaders in, in business or in politics, etc., these days, they don't do this. They wait to see what everybody else wants, and then they say they agree with them. And also, they're, they're such, focused on such a short time period, they won't commit to anything that takes too long or is too difficult or too expensive and so on and so forth. And I think that's, that's so, so fundamental change is actually out of the question in, in most cases. And it's really, to some extent, a sort of classic case of power being derived from a sort of battle between memory and forgetting, and, and, and they're winning it. But my point would be that we don't need them. We can all be leaders. We can actually drive things forward ourselves. All we have to do as individuals, households, corporations, countries, the entire planet, is decide where it is we want to go and slowly start moving in that direction. In other words, you know, if we can actually sort of pick the future we want and start building it, 
And this is clearly going to be very, very difficult. We will get a phenomenal amount of things wrong. But if we could at least agree amongst ourselves where it is we're actually going, I think we'd soon start to reperceive the present in a different way. And I think the future would be a much better place to live. And if I take you back to the map at the beginning with, with anxiety on it, one of the reasons that, one of the fundamental reasons that anxiety is a problem at the moment, I think, is that people don't have a clear view of where we're going. If you go back to the 60s and to 70s, maybe even to the 80s, there was general consensus about where the world was heading. In about the last 10 to 15 years, it's got very blurry indeed, and I think that's causing the anxiety. But if we could actually agree where it is we're going, then I, th I think the world will be a much better place. Now, I have two minutes and 53 seconds left, so I have one other chart for you. This, and again, you can't read this, but I'm going to read it for you. This is an extinction timeline. So this is predictions about what's going to die out. Now, the future is usually thought of, a bit like that first map, as new stuff that's going to happen, particularly technological stuff. But it's equally about old stuff, stuff we're incredibly familiar with, that we use every day, that's going to slowly or suddenly disappear. So this is sort of touching more on, on the, uh, the social side of things. And it's, it's, it's largely serious, but you can't help but have a bit of fun with things like this. So yes, coins are going to go. I mean, I read recently that it now takes more than a cent in America to actually make a cent because of the cost of the metal. I know people throwing them away because they're a pain in the neck. Um, so I think coins are going. Spelling's gone. Desktop computers will go. Free roads, wallets, well, it's going into your phone. Ashtrays, gone. Landline telephones, voice communication is not looking too healthy at the moment. It's all going towards text. Um, libraries. Now, I made a mistake on libraries. I just was being glib and uh, maybe logical. I, I just thought, well, why do we need public libraries when we've got ebooks and Google? What's the point of them? They're going to be dead. So I showed this um, to a group of people, and there were an awful lot of librarians in the audience for some reason, and they've got very good eyesight, and they spotted it. So I got roped into looking at the future of libraries in, in 30 years' time, and I repent because in three out of four scenarios, libraries actually do do very well. They do really badly in the future you expect, but in the other three, for various reasons, they do very well. Um, I've also got into an awful lot of trouble for putting Belgium on the list. Now, <laughs> an apology is if you're from Belgium. Now, I was trying to make a point, which is when you look at things, there is a tendency, particularly with kids, to say, that's how it's always been. Um, you know, I saw a kid recently with a printed photograph trying to tap it and do that to get the image to move. Um, you look at a, a, an atlas or a map, and you look at the lines around the countries, and you just immediately assume, well, that's how it's always been. You know, no, we put those lines there. They move around. I mean, they moved around really recently with South Sudan, and you know, if there's a country that might become South Belgium, North Belgium, well, that, that would be the one. So I'm just making a, a sort of relatively serious point about that. And there's a whole load of other stuff on there, and, and you know, you can find, just Google this, you get all this sort of stuff. I um, mean, it's just a way of getting people to actually think more deeply, I think, about what's going. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of sort of visualizing this stuff, because I think if you did that as a Microsoft Word document, nobody would give it the time of day. But if you plonk that in front of somebody and say, you know, here's an extinction timeline for the museum sector, they get really upset, and it actually then causes them to think quite deeply. And the inverse is also true. If you actually put an in innovation timeline down, looking at key innovations within a particular country or sector or industry, and then project it forward and try and imagine new ones, um, that's also a way of getting people to actually think more deeply about what they're saying. Um, I have seven seconds left. I'm going to stop. Thank you very much indeed.